We're going to be doing a wonderful project in the UK, which is measuring the value of food as medicine. Because even though, you know, like the WHO will say that our diet and lifestyle choices are a key leading cause of disease, you won't find anybody prescribing or in the medical profession, they won't be prescribing diet. So that what we decided to do was to get the evidence from the people, from the grassroots of, of food as medicine. So we'll, what we're going to follow 300 people who've chosen food as medicine as part of their treatment, but a, a, a big part of their treatment, where there's that understanding that it's going to be the make or break. In medicine, what we look at is the patient's response to treatment. Okay, so you can have two people with the same condition on the same treatment. One person will make it, the other person may not. So what's the difference? It's obviously the constitution or, or the capacity to respond. It's the strength of the individual. So we know that food actually will make, give you a strong body or a weak body. So what we're looking at is, are the outcomes and what people say, the value of food to them was in their journey and their, towards their outcome. So when, with the data that we collect, we're going to actually be measuring the value, not just of diet, but everything that the person did. So we're going to get for the first time the combination of things that they did. So we're not isolating you know, conventional medicine or any other herbal medicine or anything, we're taking it as the whole package. So it's really grassroots, it's what people do, not like what clinical trials do, which is just to measure a treatment by its own endpoint, not necessarily the patient's endpoint. We're also going to be able to look at the circumstances. So what makes the journey possible for that person? Because it's not just what you eat or what you um, put into the body. It's actually the whole collaboration, what, what support you need. What I've found in my work is the people who do the best are the people who've got the support of the people who love them around them. The data that people have put in belongs to them. Okay, so we're not going to steal it. And if they choose to give that data of their story, their narrative, into their group, supposing they belong to an arthritis group or a fibromyalgia group or, you know, another group which is working with food as a medicine. They'll be able to share it with their group and their group may get lots of people with this similar data so they can analyze it for their group. So it's going to be passed out into the communities. Well, the um, interest from health departments or the government on the project that I'm doing, um, which really stemmed out from the, um, like we had a, a group in an area in Brisbane. So it was a region where we looked at what does it take to make a person proactive? Now, at the beginning, I didn't know that that was going to come out of the data. All right, so it was just grounded research. I was fishing. And we took 30 people on a journey and they all had a chronic disease. Some of them had two or three chronic diseases and none of them could see the possibility. Okay, so we just gave them the space. It was a methodology, we did do measuring, we did capture the value, but we just looked to see what they did. And we gave them some skills in order to be able to take the reins. Not, not um, scientific skills or understanding their condition from a doctor's perspective, but just their journey and what it was gonna take. And what came out of the research, we could see that most of them became proactive. Suddenly they came from a state where you'd say they were cold. It's like, what's the point? You weren't even fiery anymore. It was just like, nothing works. What's the point in even trying? And in any case, 
I don't even have the bandwidth. All right, I'm working full time. I've got a family. I, I can't even think about my own health. I have to put them first. So what we found was the, some key things that came up in the research about what it takes to, for a person to become proactive in their own journey. And I think that, that was one of, that's one of the key things because what, what's understood, particularly when the government or the health departments are looking at participatory medicine, they're saying, you patients, you need to come on board with your treatment. And the patients are saying, well, excuse me, you need to come on board with me. So nobody's getting on board. So participatory medicine means hearing both, but from the same hymn sheet. You've got to be singing from the same hymn sheet. So what, what we found was with the model, it created this environment where they could talk. And that eased it, it started the flow. It also created an environment where the person could talk within their own family, within their own work situation, because they had clarity. They su suddenly had insight into what they needed and they didn't feel it was unreasonable. So they got others on board. And it was just watching how people are at the center of their own journey and how they can make change happen without creating conflict, without creating more friction. I think that was the fear that people had, is if I try, it's only gonna get worse. It's only gonna create more friction. My family is not gonna go with this. My workplace isn't gonna go with this. So we had two people on the course who worked in the same environment. And what they did was they created big things that they hung on their chairs. And it was from the zoo, it was like, do not feed the animals, or please do not feed. And it was a wonderful humorous and everybody got into it. They were all supporting them and encouraging them on their journey. So they didn't bring the buns around at tuck time. You know, they respected those or they didn't leave the jar of sweeties out or they changed the patterns of um, reward in the office. It was wonderful, wonderful, made it happen. Most people come on the course because they actually are going backwards and they're frightened about where they could end up and because they don't trust the advice that's being given. They're not sure whether they can get to anywhere better, but they want to, if there's a possibility, they want to see how they can do that. So it's about being how they can be proactive. So, um, so you need to ask me another question. So, so a doctor sees progress as from the test results, what do they see progress as? So a patient is going to factor in their risks. So particularly if the doctor's monitoring certain blood test results or scan results, that is a key part of it. So they're not going to ignore those risks. So they're going to be monitoring. So they're going to be questioning which or the value of a treatment all round. So for example, for a patient who's on a treatment that may stop them from going downhill, supposing they've got cancer, and the treatment says, yes, this treatment is going to shrink that cancer, it could get rid of it, that person still knows the risks, both of the treatment and of the fact that it's not going to cure it forever or it could come back. So what they're looking to do is they're looking to mitigate those other risks, which may be their practitioner isn't it, it isn't part of their the services that they offer so that's why patients doctor shop or they practitioner shop they're trying to find someone who can mitigate these other risks or improve the odds of their outcome so what we're looking at is for those patients is they want to get into the top group that did the best now from a specialist point of view 
it may be well these are your odds like a, a, a betting betting on the horses let's say so it's just an odds ratio but for the patient it, they're looking at their individual odds and they want to improve those odds so you're looking at finding the treatments that have the most value in mitigating all your risks so with this model, you can check off treatments against those key reference points that I was talking about earlier, which is um, maybe to do with your symptoms or your just, just your goals, but it can also be to getting into that survival or into a place where I want to stay in remission for as long as possible. On the course, we teach people to uh, what we call do the SWOT analysis, all right? So it's, it's like, I always say to people, just stay on your side of the fence. Don't step over to, in, and tell the specialist how to do their job, all right? So stay on your side of the fence because it's enough. You can factor in the strengths and weaknesses. That's the S and the W bit. That's the, what the specialist brings to the table. So the strengths of their treatment and the weaknesses of their treatment. If a specialist recommending it, it usually means that the strengths outweigh the weaknesses. But from your perspective, you're looking at it from, well, what's this going to mean to me in my life? Okay, so the specialist wants to give you this drug, all right? And you're thinking, oh my goodness, if I'm on this drug for a long time, it's going to push, it's going to stop the disease process, but it actually could take me backwards in other areas of my life. You know, what, what happens if I want to have a family? What happens if I want to be pregnant within the next two years and I'm still on this drug? What happens if I've got this certain thing in my family like diabetes? And what happens if this drug, as I've read, could increase my risks of getting diabetes? What happens if this drug makes me put on weight or, you know, all of those things that a specialist may think are superficial. But from the patient's perspective, when, when they start looking at the opportunities that a drug can offer them, yes, it will mean that I have peace of mind. Yes, it will mean that I'll be able to continue in my day to day life. But the threats, so this is the O, opportunities, and the T, which threats. The opportunities it'll give me, but the threats. And this is what a person is looking within their narrative. So what comes out of this isn't just the dialogue where you can say to a practitioner, I realize the benefits of what you're giving me, but I'm worried about these, this impact on my life. It also helps the person to say to themselves, when, because they've looked at other treatments, particularly diet and lifestyle factors that could mitigate some of those risks. It's actually bringing those into the fore where they can say to themselves, what is my part in this? Right, because it's no good just saying, how can others help me? you're suddenly looking at how can I help myself? You may need that treatment, but you want to get into the top. You want to be in that 20% where the disease never comes back. What can I do to help myself? What is my part in my condition? And that's when you start to take the reins, really take the reins. And that's when you see results. Well, it was very interesting because when we were unpacking all the lifestyle causes, which are the things that stand in your way due to yourself, you know, I am my own worst enemy. But the people were looking at it from the point of view of their life circumstances where they didn't have any bandwidth to factor any more change in their life. Life was difficult as it was. And they would say to me, yeah, 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 I know what I should be doing. And I would if I thought it was worth it. OK, so it was it, it, that was the the crux of it. So there was no reference point that they had for looking someone like me in my position with my condition, 
Did anybody else get better? And if they did, what was it that they did? What combination of things did they do? So what we found when we started, and it was a year program, so we followed people over a year, is that they did make those incremental changes and they did start to make changes to their diet. And they did start seeing the results. And so they actually started building within the group their own um, knowledge and the feedback between each other, which then inspired others. So it is that what, what gives confidence isn't the um, scientific evidence or the, you know, the marketing of these things. What people need, they just need confirmation that it's actually going to work. Because there's a lot of marketing about the virtues of products or, you know, if you take this, then it could do that because it's got these properties. That's not the same as actually seeing if you do this thing or if you change that lifestyle, it's going to create a clinical outcome. It is going to work for you. So that's what people need is it's confirmation that, yeah, that's going to work. So when the app is released, what we're, when we've got sufficient data on it, so we're going to be asking everybody, just use it, just stick your data in. What will happen is you'll see, you'll be able to search for people like you. So you'll be able to search your condition and then you'll be able to um, hone down, if you like, or, or dig deep into the um, variables so people like me who've got another condition, so maybe two or more conditions, and in this particular age group, maybe in this weight bracket, um, and you'll be able to, and maybe you'll say, I just want to search for people who did conventional treatment. I just want to search for people who did diet or the results of diet, or I want to search for, for what everybody did. And what these little quadrant charts will show are the um, how people scored the value of a treatment, right? In terms of it being getting them to where they wanted to be. So you'll be able to see the popularity, how many people did that, or the percentage of people that tried a certain thing, and how they scored it in terms of value. So you'll be able to see the things that worked really well and you'll be able to see the things that didn't work so well, or even the things that people scored negative value. When you're talking about value of things, what we're talking about is from the person's perspective, their journey. So it's not just medical drugs, it's not just alternative medicine and treatments. It's actually to do with what support they received, where they got it from, even what self-learning or skills they needed, courses they went on to actually enable them. So it's all the enabling things. What was most value in enabling you on your journey? So those are what we term as resources. So with the app, you'll not only be able to discover what was of value to people like you in terms of conventional or alternative medicine, but also what else they did, what other support they needed, or whatever um, skills, wherever that help came from. When we're talking about people like me, we're not just talking about people with certain conditions or female or male. We're also talking about people's circumstances. So you can also search for people where maybe affordability was an issue or accessibility was an issue. So the resources that they found or what they did that helped them to get to where they needed to be. Because the thing is, we all know that you don't have to have a lot of money to eat well. And by eating well, I don't mean gourmet, expensive food. I mean eating the, the food that's going to give you sufficient sustenance and not take you backwards. And that doesn't cost a lot. It really doesn't. So we'll see. We'll see what 
and people are full of imagination. So we'll be able to collect in the research. People will put in things maybe that they did that um, and we'll start to see a lot of people who did the same thing. So we will build the data and we'll keep adding to the app and the categories and the subcategories so people can you know, then select those things. Oh yes, I did that. You know, that was meaningful to me. And we can start seeing what it is from a grassroots perspective that helps communities or people to flourish and thrive. The narrative is so incredibly important because it contextualizes. Um, and so there'll be a place in the app, in your own wallet, if you like, where you're able to put what you did, what your experience is, you'll be able to write about your journey. So that when, if you decide to share that with others, whether it's for um, exchange, bartering, or because you want to do it for the common good, people will be able to see um, what you did and when on your journey how it was that you, it's, the, it's really the means by which you traveled, what you felt, what was important to you. I think the worth of that narrative is that it can give people tremendous hope, the people who are lost, and they can feel, I'm not on my own. There's someone like me. <laughs> And you don't get that from a graph, a dot on a graph. Meaningless can help you make a decision on, yeah, I'll give that a go. But without the narrative, unless of course you're very strong and you've got lots of people backing you, but even if you've got lots of people backing you, I can tell you when you're fighting a chronic disease, you feel lonely. And it's important that people have people like them supporting them. It's very interesting, this thing of value and how much it's worth, how much the narrative is worth or how much the journey is worth. And um, somebody said to me once when they did their, when we were talking about this, they were saying, well, I don't see how my information is going to be of value to anyone. And I said, okay. I said, can you tell me how much your journey has cost you? And how many cul-de-sacs you went down? How many surgeons did you see? How many treatments did you try before you got to where you, were, you wanted to be right now? And she said, well, it cost me thousands and thousands of dollars you know, 20,000, 30,000, plus time lost from work. Years, 10 years of my best years during my 20s when I couldn't work, couldn't have a relationship. So I said, what would it have meant to you if you could have found someone just like you who said, I've done it and I can show you what worked for me and it may help you short circuit your journey. What would that be worth? And she said, oh my God, I see what you mean. So, so their narrative is their property. It's their journey. It's not up for grabs. It's not up for people stealing that, cherry picking it, analyzing it, taking the bits that they want for more analytics. It actually belongs to the person, it's theirs. So Health Commons is going to recognize that the person owns that data and we're going to be able to put it into a legal 
or make it a legal artifact where it is protected. So the ownership of that data is protected, belonging to the person. It is up to the person who they want to share it with, whether they want to trade it, whether they want to barter it. But the important thing is they're going to give permission for the analytics of their data to be used for the common good. So that a part of their data can be used to populate these quadrant charts so that people can start their journey. So the original vision probably was 2004 and it was my friction with my patients coming to me with their confusion with so many treatments not knowing what worked and I couldn't tell them and I said this is ridiculous there is nothing other than marketing propaganda out there which doesn't take into account a person's condition or their circumstances so there's no knowledge of what works and I said I felt that until we had that knowledge that was freely available, then we wouldn't move forward in terms of writing the degeneration that is occurring. Because I know I've taken so many people on a journey towards health where they have healed. I know that people, if they've got the information and the confirmation, that they will take the steps and they will do what is necessary if they feel it's worth it. So we had, it was my dream. If we could have this wonderful, completely treatment agnostic, has to become from the people, it's what they actually do, transparent. If we could have that, then that would be a wonderful legacy for future generations to build upon. But it would be owned by the people. It would be their narratives, not a top-down approach. Top-down approach is a stance. You know, it's how, how we conduct health. This is what we think you should do. It's a stance. It's not a science. I think the clinical evidence speaks for itself. It's not that, you know, medicine is wrong. It's just it, but people need to say, what is my part in this? Some wonderful things in medicine, wonderful things. It can give people a breathing space. It can give them quality of life. But it's missing the patient participation. What I want to do is I want to be able to help communities <laughs> reshape around what, what's going to work for them, to give them, them the tools. I don't feel that it has to be community driven. You know, the communities have to want that. So again, it's not going to be a top down thing of, of you know, it's, we can only do what our council permit us to do or what funds we can work with. And this is about people coming together to reclaim the land in terms of rebuilding the land, of rebuilding our cottage industries that provide resilience. It's whatever it takes to make a, a community resilient, which is not just the food that we eat. It's the um, care, it's compassion, it's looking after each other. That's what, that's what makes resilience. I think it sums up in something that one of the participants said to me at the end. She said, I never realized that people could be so kind. <laughs>